Welcome back to the Chess Geek channel. We are continuing our masterclass on the Karo Khan today. We are moving on to chapter 3, which deals with the fantasy variation. The fantasy, if you're not aware, is e4, c6, d4, d5, and now the move f3. Now, this chapter in particular is the most tactical one. It's very double-edged. The positions that you will see that arise from the fantasy are incredibly aggressive and just very hectic in nature. And therefore, if there was ever a time to study the moves, this would be the chapter to do so. In the other chapters, you can watch the videos, learn the ideas, and then get away with playing slightly different move orders as long as you're sticking to the general strategical ideas and plans. But in this one, it is important to learn the actual uh, theoretical continuations. Luckily, I am providing a complete PGN to this chapter and every other chapter. You can find that on my website. The link is in the description. So if you want to continue studying the PGNs, then feel free to do so on Chessable, Lee Chess, Chess Base, whatever you prefer. So with that being said, let's jump straight in. And I want to start by talking a little bit about the basic strategies for both players with the fantasy. White is basically saying this. By playing F3, they're solidifying their center and they're basically maintaining a stronger center than we are. But in exchange for this, they're of course weakening greatly their king and also delaying their development and blocking some critical squares like the square on f3. That is why um, for a very long time, the move e6 has been one of the main moves in this position. Our idea is, yes, we're delaying our development of the light square bishop, but we're maintaining a very solid setup and we're highlighting the fact that their kingside pieces do not have the luxury of developing to their greatest squares. I'm not recommending this. I'm recommending D takes E5, F takes E5, and this seems on the surface to justify their move F3 because now suddenly their knight can hop in and they have a huge center. This seems like it went totally wrong for us. However, because of that, we immediately strike with E5. We give them temporarily a strong center, but we strike quickly with e5 with hopes of highlighting the weaknesses on these diagonals and trying to go for their strong center from the get-go. I do want to emphasize, after you watch this video, if these tactical and sharp uh, ideas do not resonate with you, you can certainly go e6, play a bit more solid and positionally, um, but, but I do think you'll enjoy these tactical lines because they're very fun to look at and play around with. I mean, the tactical ideas for both sides are really interesting and cool, um, and it's a whole lot of fun to, to play through. So let's begin. We go e5, immediately striking and trying to take back control in the center, and I want to share um, a couple of the mistakes that can happen early on. In this position, there's basically one move and one move only. That's the move knight f3. Basically, they cannot take here, because then the weakness here becomes very strong. You're not even going for the for the end game that is probably good for us. We're going for an attack. We're going queen h4. We're going to force them to misplace their king. Of course, g3 allows us to win the rook in a very common tactical idea. So they have to move their king here. Um, and then we can even regain the material immediately. Their king is misplaced. This is a whole disaster. This is unthinkable for white. We're completely winning. So instead, they can't take... So their only real options, it seems, is to defend this pawn. And so the moves c3 or bishop to e3 come to mind just to develop um, and try to keep a strong uh, center uh, on the middle of the board. But a move like c3 doesn't work either because we still go queen h4. This does not address the issue of this diagonal. We go queen h4, this pawn is still uh, going to fall, and our attack will still continue. So the only move is knight f3 very multi-purpose move. They are defending the center, putting pressure on our center, and stopping uh, the attack on h4. So what do we do? We go bishop to g4. Our idea is basically to try to remove that knight as quickly as possible so that all of these pressure in the center and this attack on the king side become possible. Very logical so far. Now, there's really two possibilities for how they can play. Notice they can't really play so slow and solid here. You know, a move like h3 or just playing slowly in general will not work. Here we can take and we're up a pawn. They have no justification or compensation for this pawn. Our development is smooth and easy. This is uh, also a disaster for them. 
And aside from this, there's, you know, a few other options. The move c3 is possible, but this will actually transpose to another variation that we're going to see uh, momentarily. We go knight e7, and here the best option is bishop c4, which will transpose, and I'll show that in a second. We're starting with bishop c4, which is the most common, the most testing variation. What white is trying to do is highlight our huge lack in development by going for an immediate and quick attack on f7. We have to play very precisely here. A move like knight f6 already blunders. And you can pause for a second, but the move is bishop takes f7. And after king takes, uh, knight takes e5, this would be a horrible way to lose the game. Notice two attackers on the bishop uh, and a fork. We're going to lose back the piece, uh, and they're going to gain some interest for it. So what we play after bishop to c4 is the very important knight to d7. And it's very logical why we play this. The issue with bishop takes f7 was that it, it was followed up with knight e5, but now we solidify that square. So bishop takes f7, knight e5, we simply take that knight and defend the bishop. Happy days. In this position, there's really a couple of options for them. c3 is one of the ways to play. And as I mentioned, this transposed to that line that we just saw. So we're going to focus on this as well. The other option, the more common option, is castling which is, in my opinion, more natural. They're trying to add even further pressure on f7. So we're going to get to this very tactical and sharp line momentarily, but I want to look at c3 first. With the move c3, their idea is a little hidden, and so you do definitely need to focus on this one. Their idea is queen to b3. They're trying to hit f7 and simultaneously hit b7, and this is a very dangerous um, idea for them. There's a couple of ways that we can deal with this. The move b5 uh, is certainly a possibility in this position, trying to either force the bishop off of this really strong diagonal, or if it wants to maintain its control on this diagonal, now the queen cannot come here and work with the bishop. So b5 is possible, but I actually recommend bishop h5. And the point of bishop h5, we maintain the pressure here. We don't create huge weaknesses on the queen side that otherwise, you know, we they could have targeted that once we go b5. They can try to break through with a4 and make some progress here. What we do instead is maintain control on f7, maintain control on this diagonal, and you know we're still hitting the knight. And now we're really taking the sting out of queen to b3 because we can simply play queen to c7. The, the pawn here is very nicely guarded. We defend this pawn, defend our center. We have a very solid structure here. Um, and for example, after castles, we can develop our knight. Notice that a move like knight g5 might seem very dangerous at first because, wow, they have a lot of pieces heading towards our king side, but this is why we didn't go b5. We wanted to keep this pawn structure very safe and solid so that we could completely bait them and castle long here. This is a really cool idea. We're giving them completely this pawn. Make sure whenever they take with the knight, the knight lands here, we have the ability to take, so it's not a fork, but we're happy to give away this pawn right? The second we give away this pawn, yes, we're down a pawn, but our king is super safe, and suddenly their king is not, and we're going to start attacking here. We already win back the pawn, first of all. That's a key detail. We can always choose to take here and open up an attack like this. The bishop can come uh, to d6 and also team up, and I'll just show you how something could develop. We don't have to play immediately. Again, we regain the material, so a move like king b8 is super principal here to keep our uh, king as safe as can be, but ultimately, the knight comes in, we can eventually take, we develop our bishop, we can go h5, h4, we're already hitting this pawn. We're, we're building up some clear pressure here, and it's not very clear that they have that same pressure on our king, because we're very safe here, and they don't have the, the pieces and the firepower to generate a, a powerful attack. So that's how I recommend going and dealing with c3. Bishop h5 to maintain the integrity of our queenside pawn structure so we can look to castle long. So even if the pressure on f7 becomes overwhelming, we're happy to give away that pawn in exchange for a deadly attack on their king. Super fun stuff. So after knight to d7, remember, they just developed the bishop to c4. We go knight d7. This was c3, which is one option, but castling is often considered the more mainline, the more aggressive option because they're adding pressure onto f7. Now, I want to share a couple of different options for us here, and you're going to see both of these options in this game here. 
one option is for us to again castle long and again go for a crazy attack on the king that is often the the best objective and practical chance but there's also cases where you can still castle short if you develop and they don't go for a crazy attack and put all of the pressure they can then castling short is often a very solid and safe way to try to get our king safe and then try to emphasize some of the weaknesses uh, in the center so you're going to see both of these strategies and ways to play in these resulting positions but first we need to address the main issue they have pressure on f7 they're threatening already some nasty ideas with bishop takes f7 and then knight takes e5 right with a double check um, and for that reason knight to f6 is the critical move you first go knight to d7 to take away this possibility of quickly going for bishop takes f7 and then once they castle now you go knight f6 to block this attack so develop your knights in a very specific move order as to block and take the sting out of their attacks. So knight to f6. And here there's a couple of options that I want to mention. D takes on e5 is perhaps the most natural move here. And we don't want to take immediately. That would be a horrible move because after queen takes, rook takes, notice the pin is gone. And therefore they can simply win our knight in that position. So the very critical and important move here is queen to b6 check. Notice that this check becomes possible when they took. And after the king moves, now we take. And the, the pin here cannot be, um, cannot be dismissed, basically. They cannot take and get rid of that pin. We're also attacking the knight, but also the bishop. So there's really two options here. There's bishop to b3 and there's bishop to e2. We're going to look at one game with each. So let's begin with bishop e2. And this game will really beautifully demonstrate the ways that you can castle long and then try to generate some attack. So the move knight takes was played, and then bishop to e6. Often taking here again is, is not the best option, keeping the two bishops especially because we're going for some aggressive ideas with an attack on the king is beneficial for us. Knight d7 here, what's the point? Blocking the queen so that castling is possible. And after we castle, Notice that there's already pressure on their queen. The knight can hop back in a variety of ways. Our bishop can develop safely. And let's see how this sort of position developed. So the bishop came in. We had queen e5. Notice we're the ones with the initiative. We're always the ones throwing the punches. We do have a trade of bishops. Um, and as you'll see, a big trade of rooks as well. Um, and a, a couple moves later, uh, also a trade of queens. So what white tried to do is they noticed that our attack is super deadly and hard to disarm. So they did the only thing they could do. They traded down into an end game, but this end game is better for us because they have a weak uh, and exposed pawn on E4 that is isolated. They have other weaknesses in their camp and our pawn structure is super safe and solid. Our pieces are more aggressively uh, placed for an attack. And although they have the control over the D file, that's very easy to fix. I mean, a move like king to c7 and rook to d8 can ensure us equal control over that file. So let's see what happens. c5, the rook went back. We won a pawn. Then we took control over the d file. And even though an endgame might seem like a draw, it's not in this, in this particular case because we have the better pieces. We have the better initiative. And you can see with some nice tactics, we're distracting the king away from the bishop. They can't do anything about it. We win a piece, and a couple moves later, we also win the game. And right here, resignation occurred. Of course, this pawn is running up the board. There's nothing you can do about it. So this was a great example of castling long and winning by doing that. Uh, I do want to emphasize something maybe that you noticed in this particular game. Again, the attack never really came because we traded into an endgame, but because we had the threat of building a huge attack, they were forced to trade into an endgame that, as I mentioned, for the reasons before, wasn't too good for us. It was definitely an endgame which we were the only ones playing for a, a better result. We were the only ones playing for a win. Okay, so going back, this is one of the options, them dropping the bishop back to e2. I want to also show bishop to b3, and this will show a nice example of short castling. So bishop to c5, and, and simply short castling. Now, in this particular case, let's see how the position continues and develops. Queen to c7, we have bishop to d6, the rooks will come into the center, 
we have developed all of our pieces with meaning, right? This bishop pins the knight. This knight adds extra pressure. These pieces aim at the bishop and this weak pawn behind it. This knight puts infinite pressure on the pawn. And in the next couple of moves, you'll see also uh, this rook comes into the game as well. Every development we've done has been with an agenda, with something further. Their knight and bishop are kind of stranded on the other side. The bishop is good, sure, but the knight here specifically is not doing a whole lot. Now, in this particular game, um, we had some shuffling. Eventually, just by the natural uh, development of the game, we ended up winning a, a pawn. And again, I would say that is partly due to the fact that we were the ones with the punch. We were the ones with the initiative. They always had to defend and eventually something gave. Now, we're also threatening this fork and this fork. It's very difficult to defend both. Um, and, and just a couple moves later, resignation occurred here white resigned because although they can take our rook we're then going to take here and in the end of all of these trades we remain up the exchange they can't even take on f7 this is brutal so you can play these sort of tactical positions in a variety of ways castling short castling long generating attacks trading into an end game it's a very flexible way to play and depending on how you're feeling you can certainly make um, a couple of different uh, different positions on the board. So this was d takes on e5. I want to briefly show some alternatives. Bishop g5 is an aggressive way trying to further add more pressure in the position. I like the move queen to b6 here, trying to not only put pressure on this weakened pawn that cannot move, but also this newly weakened pawn here. Now, some people might fear that after bishop takes, wait a minute, if we take with the knight, aren't we allowing something like this? Well, we, we certainly are. But we can take with the pawn. And this is what some people, I think, don't really uh, notice, at least not uh, originally. By taking with the pawn, yes, we're ruining our pawn structure. But wait a minute, this G file is insane, right? It, it's a great way for us to come in and generate an attack. And as I've shown, castling long is a very legitimate way to play these positions, and that's exactly what you can go for here. Long castles, and suddenly, wow, this this weakened two double pawns here are actually a very big uh, bonus for us in this position, and we can use them and the open files that they allow to generate some serious attacks. Queen takes b2, for example, is a possibility here, not caring about material, because something like this will not end well. We can go bishop d6, add further pressure, g3 bishop takes king to g2 but after rook check king takes and queen to c3 check this is actually just a mating attack by the way a uh, very beautiful mating attack as well something like this checkmate so the point that i was trying to illustrate by looking at this variation of bishop g5 is that definitely do not care about the material or the pawn structure integrity on your king side as long as you haven't made huge weaknesses on the queen side, if your king can castle safely uh, on the long side, then you're fine with giving double pawns, you're fine with sacrificing a pawn. Some cases, that will actually just um, push your attack further and, and really give you some great initiative. So that was a very fun variation. And the final quick thing I want to mention is king h1 here, which has been played, and it's quite logical trying to get rid of all these checks and the annoying... Uh, tactical ideas we had on this diagonal, I recommend bishop d6, which might seem a bit awkward. I mean, the bishop's undefended, there's some x-rays here, but tactically, this is actually just completely fine. We're ready to go queen to c7 and help this bishop. In the meantime, we're adding more pressure here. We're happy in some cases to potentially take and open up this bishop. Um, I'll show you a, a very quick variation. If they were to trade now, they have to again drop their bishop back because of the pressure that we've built up here. And we go queen to c7, and I didn't continue this variation because, as we've seen, there's a million ways to play this. I would say the most natural is to cast along, line up the attack on the queen, line up all of these, you know, pressure, h5, h4 is fun, you can get the knight, I mean, this is one of those insane positions that you just really crave if you're an aggressive and tactical player. However, if you're not looking for that very aggressive double-edged position, it's also fine, I suppose, to just castle short here. And this is one of the nice flexibilities, uh, 
that you get with this setup, you can always castle short, get your rook to the to the d8 square, still add some pressure, still have some initiative. It doesn't have the same punch to it, but you're also playing a much lower risk position. So depending on your playing style, there's positions that you can you can uh, you can crave and go for with the fantasy variation for every single playing style, aggressive or positional. You can play the fantasy very very well. So hopefully this video helped you. This is one of my favorite variations because it's super fun and exciting. Um, the fantasy just super aggressive, tactical, double edged. I love these sort of positions. Hopefully. You do too now that you've watched this video. Subscribe if you're new around here and enjoy the things that you are seeing. Like this video if you learned something new from it. And I'll see you guys next time. Peace out.